Hello and welcome to this edition of Consciousness Raising Online. And let me make sure I'm not too loud. Um, today, I call this the true, true success story of the richest black girl in the world. And this is actually an upbeat story today. Um, but it, it, it is it's such a deep story because, number one, I'm going to share with you today some information on this story that, um, as far as I know, has not been widely revealed. And it deals with the fact that there's so much misinformation, lies, and distortions about this girl and her story and everything is like amazing and this is going on a hundred years um, first of all Sarah Rector and some of you all probably have seen this book or seen this picture and all of this over the years this photograph which I've always hated uh, it turns out first of all this is not Sarah Rector, okay? That's the first thing I want you to understand. You're going to see this photo over and over, and there's another one too, uh, not as widely distributed, but, but fairly so. It's not her either. I'm going to show you some photos of the real Sarah Rector, and this, this information comes from her family, because she's still got family alive today, her descendants and, and nieces, nephews, and whatever. And uh, they said, that's not Sarah. And you'll understand why uh, they have, in, for a long, long time, they intentionally allowed this photo to be uh, representative of Sarah Rector. Okay? Um, but the story itself is so amazing. Uh, that it just blew me away. So let's let's talk about this. Um, in 1914, there was a headline in the Kansas City Star. Quote: Oil made Piccaninny rich. Oklahoma girl with fifteen thousand dollars a month gets many proposals. Four white men in Germany want to marry the Negro child so they might share in her fortune. The rich Oklahoma girl was Sarah Rector. Now she was black and a member of the Muscogee Creek Nation, best known as being the richest colored girl in the world. Now, let's, let's talk about this for a second. Um, the Muscogee, or the Creek uh, tribe, they were considered to be one of the, quote, five civilized tribes. Okay? Um, and you can do the history on this at some point. But there was, there was a... Uh, a, a long walk that they made these tribes take to go out west and give up their land over east. And they were given this land out there. It was in Oklahoma. And uh, these five so-called civilized tribes, the reason they were called civilized tribes is because they imitated some of the white folks stuff, some of the European stuff, including having slaves, enslaved black people. So they get out there to Oklahoma and um, they uh, got this land. They were given land out there. Now, what also happened was that at a certain point, uh, in 18, uh, let's see, tr eight, the Treaty of 1866 
made by the United States with the five civilized tribes. And so what happened was that they were granted the land and then the enslaved black people, when they became ex-slaves, they were granted land out of that land that the five civilized tribes had in Oklahoma. Well, you know how they did. They gave the black people the worst land. But what happened was that they got 166 acres, all the black folks, each one of them, including the children. So, um, Sarah Rector, she got 166 acres too, but it was terrible land. It was rocky. It wasn't no good for farming or nothing. And um, then on top of that, they had to pay $30 annual property tax on her parcel of land. So at one point, her father tried to sell it, but the courts wouldn't allow it. Okay? See, they, 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 this ain't new. <laughs> so what he did instead was he leased her parcel of land to the Standard Oil Company. Now, that turned out to be a great move because in 1913, an independent oil driller by the name of B.B. Jones, he, he produced a gusher, as it was called, and that gusher brought in 2,500 barrels of oil a day. Well, now little Sarah at that point now received an income of $300 per day. Wait, let, let, let me go back a minute. This is 1913. And she's getting now $300 a day. And, <laughs> yeah, now the whole world changed, didn't it? And also what happened, the courts and the government out there, they assigned a guardian to uh, her money, her stuff. And that, of course, had to be a white man. It was a man named T.J. Porter. He personally knew the family, but the court gave him guardianship over her money. Okay? Now this is, I'm going to get into this a little bit deeper as we go along because some some foul stuff tried to happen to this little girl and her money. Um, now her parcel became part of a famous oil field called the Cushing Drumright Oil Field. And even though there were other oil fields that uh, were productive she started, oh, in fact, in that same parcel of land, they, other wells opened up. And so, October 1913, when she was only 12 years old, she started getting her royalties. The first check was for $11,500. Now, we're talking about 1913. Now, this is, this is a photo that has gone worldwide. Um, and you know, I just hate, maybe some of the, the, the sisters can tell me what that is hanging off her head. I always think about them being like ear muscles or something, but it just makes her look so pitiful. But anyway, to find out from her family, that wasn't her. This is another photo that uh, was fairly famous that was supposed to have been of her. This wasn't her either. Okay. And as I said, part of the reason why they did that, why they allowed that photo to be out there like that, 
uh, as she became to be more world famous, she not only had men writing letters to her, trying to propose to her, but her life was threatened. And I'll show you why in a few minutes. But here is the actual photo of Sarah Rector as an as a, a, a older woman. This was this was from her family. Okay, this is Sarah Rector as a grown woman. Okay, and um, here's another one. This is with one of her one of her sons. She had she when she got married, she eventually had three sons, and this is one of them. Uh, so she looked quite different than uh, than the, the the photo the other photos made her look right. Uh, <laughs> but now. What happened was that the laws of Oklahoma at the time said that uh, any of the Native Americans or African American adults and children who were citizens of the Indian Territory with any significant accumulation of wealth and property, by law, they would be assigned to a guardian, a white person, who was seen as being more responsible of, and capable of handling their finances. So that's how she uh, had her fortune turned over to the guardianship of T.J. Porter. Okay? Um, now, understand there were other children uh, in the area who were uh, children of, some of them were Native American children, some of them were uh, African uh, of uh, uh, black children who also had land some of them had some oil nobody had as much oil as, as, as uh, Sarah Rector's land but some of the others did have some oil and the speculators and the swindlers and the, all these the con people they ran out there by the thousands trying to get to them kids and, the, and their families so in uh, Sarah Rector's case, here's what happened. Here's an example. This is from uh, this is from the Charlotte Evening Chronicle, November fifth, nineteen thirteen. Wealthiest Negro in the world. This is reprint from the New York Herald. Sarah Rector, a ten-year-old Negro girl who lives in a humble cabin near Muskogee, Oklahoma, is said to have the largest income of any man or woman of her race in the world. The royalties from the oil wells, which the small Negro girl owns, are coming in at a rate which makes her annual income twice as large as that of the President of the United States. Despite the fact that that she is receiving the sum of $475 every day of her life, which amounts to $14,250 a month, or $171,000 a year, Sarah lives as simply as any of the other Negro boys and girls whose parents, like her own, are tenant farmers and cotton pickers. When she is old enough to be sent away from home, she will be entered at some boarding school for Negro girls, and some of her money will be spent in making her a well-educated and accomplished woman. Sarah uh, is the owner of 160 acres of oil land, which she has leased through her guardian, T.J. Porter, to the Prairie Oil and Gas Company. Two wells have been sunk, one of which yields 2,000 barrels a day, while the second yields 1,800 barrels a day. Nine more wells will soon be in operation, and it is probable that Sarah's wealth will then soar much higher. <laughs> now, I 
want y'all to understand how deep this is. If this was happening in like 1913, 1914. Here's another article. Check this out. Uh, Guthrie, Oklahoma. Now, remember, this is all taking place in Oklahoma right now, right? November 14th. This state has the honor of possessing, as one of its young citizens, the wealthiest colored girl in the world. She is the owner of 160 acres of oil land, which she has leased to her guardian, J.T. Porter, to the Standard Oil Company. Okay? Um, and, and you notice there's two different things. The Standard Oil Company, which of course was Rockefeller and them. And then there's this other company that keeps getting named too. That was like a subsidiary. Okay? Um... <laughs> they also talk about how the parents and how they're living in, you know, in modest situation and all of that, right? Um, I got to read this one too. This is deep. Um, Oklahoma Negro Girl gets $475 a day. And it says... Um, is making 10 year old Sarah Rector immensely rich and she will soon have a yearly income of over a million dollars. Okay? And she soon will be the richest colored person in the world and will probably have to pay more income tax than any citizen of Oklahoma. <laughs> yeah, they definitely was looking forward to that money, right? To that tax money. Um, now, this would give you the impression, of course, that uh, her parents didn't have anything, any uh, enough knowledge to do anything. That was all in control of a white man, right? Check this out. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. In fact, Sarah is becoming so rich that the Muskogee Bank handles her money, uh, has had a special bank book engraved and letters with gold leaf for her account. Um, let's see. Oh, here's, here's one of the points I wanted to mention. Now keep your eye on whenever we, we see what her share was. Now, this article says Sarah gets one eighth royalty from the oil. And with oil at one dollar and three cents a barrel, it can easily be figured that Sarah Rector bids fair to become the wealthiest member of her race in the world. Nine other wells are, being, are now being drilled on the Rector land. And if they prove as productive as those two wells already drilled, Sarah will soon have a yearly income of nearly $1 million. Now, I find it interesting that she's only getting one-eighth of, of the money. Okay? If she's only getting one-eighth, that means seven-eighths of the money is going somewhere else. All right? The oil company is one, but, you know, <laughs> I think it's also them others. All right. T.J. Porter, a farmer and stockman at Beland, Oklahoma, is guardian for the girl who lives in a little cabin on the Porter Place. First of all, that was a lie. They lived on their own land, Okay. Sarah naturally has no conception of the flood of wealth about to engulf her. The lease of the land was originally bought by the Prairie Oil and Gas Company through the probate court in Muskogee County, and a bonus of $1 an acre was paid for it. B.B. Jones of Bristow, Oklahoma, Afterward, brought bought the lease from the Prairie Company. See, I'm telling you this. I'm, I'm telling you this, excuse me, because I want you to get an idea 
of how they were working on trying to steal the, the money from the child, steal her wealth. Not, I'm not, not just the money, they were trying to steal that land and the oil. Okay, here's December uh, 1915, okay? Now, this is, now remember, they were in Oklahoma, all right? Now, because of a late ruling of the county court at Tulsa, Oklahoma, and y'all know what happened in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in 1921, this is 1915, in which the owner of an oil lease is forced to turn over to the lessee the royalty oil instead of its equivalent. All right, what this meant basically was that the owner of the oil lease, who, remember I just uh, read you where somebody bought the lease and they were trying to rip it off her, but this court said, no, she, the owner, uh, gets that money, gets that royalty, okay? Sarah Rector, one of the very rich, if not the richest Negro girl in Oklahoma, and probably in all the world, now is receiving in royalties $2,000 more a month than before. According to this ruling, her guardian, J.T. Porter, is permitted to sell this royalty oil in the open market at the highest price available and has entered into a contract with an oil company to buy it at 10 cents premium a barrel. And all it's basically saying is that now they can control the oil themselves. All right? The family through the guardian. Okay? Um... It is said the lease now produces 160,000 barrels a month. Think about that. This down down near the end, about near the bottom, it says the lease now produces 160,000 barrels a month, one eighth of which is her royalty. This amount at 90 cents a barrel brings her $18,000 a month. Whew. <laughs> uh, how much is $18,000 a month uh, times 12? Well, times 10 is 10 months. That's $180,000. Add two more. 36. It's over $200,000 a year. Okay? So now she's getting this money hand over fist. Um... So now here's what happens. Here's what happens. Um, the Chicago Defender also played a role in this because the word was getting out that supposedly they were that you know they were trying to take the, take the the girl's land and her money. Now, April third, I think this is nineteen fifteen. Okay. Little Sarah Rector has been located. She is here now. This is Muskogee, Oklahoma. And her guardian has at last decided to move her and the little rectors, the other little rectors, into a frame house costing $1,000. Her income amounts to $15,000 per month. Although 10 years old, white suitors are writing her with a view to engaging her for marriage at the earliest time after she becomes of age. Four youths of Germany are writing her constantly to pledge her love to one of them. When she becomes of marriageable age, the state of Kansas will be selected because the laws uh, permit marriages of all races. See, remember they're in Oklahoma. Now they're talking about Kansas. Now, the Chicago Defender wrote this piece, and they said, Oklahoma is a disgrace. Oklahoma is the state that murders men and women of the race without mercy or justice. This is the state that mobs an Afro-American woman because she protects her virtue. This is the state that has on its statute books all kinds of nefarious Jim Crow laws, and now it would countenance little Sarah Rector's 
if of age, going into another state to marry a white foreigner just to get her millions. Duty of the women's clubs. This is deep. It is the duty of the National Federation of Women's Clubs, of which Mrs. Booker T. Washington is president, to see as far as possible that the parents of this little girl is not uh, annoyed with any love affairs by fakers or grafters, but that, on the other hand, that she becomes well-educated and encouraged to marry one of her own race. Now, you never even heard about this, right? They don't teach none of this in, 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 in schools. Mrs. Booker T. Washington? Now, check out what happened. Um, this is the Muscogee Times Democrat. This is March of 1915, okay? Little Sarah Rector, being trained at Tuskegee School, as benefits her great wealth. If money and education can make her so, Sarah Rector, a scrawny, kinky-haired Negro girl, is going to be the leading uh, something lady of the land. Sarah is 12 years old, and with her curly pigtails and pigeon toes, Looks like the ordinary Negro girl that you see playing in the street. But there is one advantage she has. Sarah is rich. Now, see the description? And see, this is white people writing a description of this little black girl, right? And this is part of the reason why her family um, allowed a photograph that they knew was not her to be circulated. So to protect her. Now, not rich in the sense that many Negro families would be, but immensely wealthy. She is the owner of one of the biggest oil producing allotments in Creek County in the Cushing oil field. Until recently, she lived on a farm in Muscogee County near Bellin with her people. The house she occupied was a three room affair drawn together with boards and looked like the ordinary Negro family you would see on any Negro farm. But when the money began to roll in, Sarah was taken from her squalid surroundings and sent to Tuskegee, Alabama to be educated and dressed like a lady. In Booker T. Washington School, she is making progress, so letters from there to Negro businessmen state. While progress is slow, as Sarah is not the brightest girl in the African race, she is nevertheless gaining ground. See, I did this, 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 this. You have to, you have to just get an idea. This was going on in, 20, in 1915, and it was like this whole thing of trying to get her money. When Booker T. Washington was here last summer, he was taken by a number of Negro businessmen to the home of the rector girl and looked her over. Before he came here, arrangements had been made by Edward Curd, her attorney, and County Judge Leahy among, and others to send her to Tuskegee. Here are a few figures that will give you an idea of Sarah's wealth. Her oil lands are producing 12,000 barrels of oil a day which at the present price, market price of, I think that's 35, it's either 35 uh, cents a barrel, I guess, I don't know, bringing $4,200 a day. But Sarah only gets one eighth of this, which would make her income the pitiful sum of $525 a day or $188,000 a year. During the past few months, the company that buys her oil has not been taking it all, but is placing about half of it in storage. So Sarah will have to be economical and retrench. If it will be necessary, according to Mr. Curd, for her to try and eke out an existence until times are better on the trifling sum of $94,000 a year. 
See, I'm telling y'all. They were scheming and conning and doing everything they could to get her money. But she was getting, she was, she, see, don't believe that stuff about she was scrawny and this, that, and other, and she was dumb, or what they say, she wasn't the smartest of her race and all of that. And uh, she was down there at Tuskegee Institute just barely making it. Mm -mm. Okay. Now, here's September 1915. Okay. Um, now, she's 14 here. She appeared, per, no, Rebecca, her sister, I uh, was 14. She appeared personally before this Judge Leahy and filed a petition objecting to the appointment of E.D. Sweeney of Muskegee, Muskogee as her guardian and nominating T.J. Porter, the present guardian. Check what they were doing. Joseph and Rose Rector, the parents of the girl, filed their objection to the appointment of Sweeney Wednesday afternoon. They accompanied their daughters, Rebecca and Sarah, when they were taken before Judge Leahy Thursday by T.J. Porter for the purpose of consultation with the county judge as to where to send the girls to a school. The girls were sent to Tuskegee Institute last year, but a different college was selected for this year. The likelihood of the appointment to a new guardian is small. In the case of Rebecca, uh, Rebecca Rector, who is 14 years of, old, of age, the girl may nominate her own guardian. In the cases of Sarah, age 13, and Joseph Jr., age 11, the parents may file nominations. The court may make its own appointment, but the wishes of the parents, when apparently well accounted for, are very seldom ruled against. The Rector family declared that Porter has the interests of the children at heart and is an honest, efficient man. They contend that E.D. Sweeney, who is cashier of the Commercial National Bank, does not have the interests of the children at heart, does not know them, and wants the, the position of its enabling him to handle the money to the interests of the bank. You know what I thought about when I read this? <laughs> Years ago, there was a TV show called the Beverly Hillbillies, where this this these these hillbillies, these white hillbillies, um, they, they got they struck oil, okay. And in fact, the theme song was about the bubbling crude, right? Up through the ground, come a bubbling crude. So they they became instantly rich and they moved to Beverly Hills. Got a big old mansion and everything. In fact, what what did, what, what the doofus boy called it a cement pond swim pool, right? But the, the the money was in this bank run by oh, what was the banker's name? Mr. Drysdale. And Mr. Drysdale was like, he was straight up con man, you know, ran the bank, and he guarded their money. <laughs> he treated their money like it was his money. And Mr. Drysdale, that's who I thought about. I said, he was the prototype. This, this dude, D.B. Sweeney or whatever, was the, was the prototype. And, and then I realized that, you know what? The Beverly Hillbillies was actually maybe uh, inspired by the Sarah Rector story. Okay, check this out. Here she is when she turned 18, okay? 18-year-old Negro girl, Rich Harris. This is 1920. Sarah Rector... 18 today was Oklahoma's first Negro millionaire heiress. Now it's interesting they call her an heiress. She didn't inherit the money. <laughs> the money came from her world wells. Fearing an attempt to secure possession of her wealth she inherited, Sarah voluntarily executed a deed of trust covering all her wealth. 
Two men who have served as her guardians will administer her affairs. Exception of the deed of trust probably will quash a petition filed by the girl's mother to have her declared incompetent and secure the appointment of a guardian. Now this disturbed me because I said was her mama trying to trying to take her money? Okay. Well, here's a few a few minutes later really. Um this is uh, December of 19 uh this is 1918. Okay. Dig this. Milton Young. Now, this is the one that really made me think about Mr. Drysdale. Milton Young, cashier at the, of the Exchange National Bank of Muskogee, was appointed joint guardian of the estate of Sarah Rector, Wealthy Creek Miner, this morning by County Judge Glenn Alcorn on petition of the girl and her parents. Young's bond was fixed at $15,000, which he furnished. He will enter at once upon his duties as guardian of the state, which is one of the largest of the many owned by Muskogee County Creek Miners. Young will serve in conjunction with T.J. Porter, who has heretofore been sole guardian of Sarah Rector's interests. The Rector girl... Okay, yeah, this is back before. The Rector girl has just reached the age of 14, entitling her to have a person of her own nomination named Guardian with the approval of the county judge. She was well satisfied with the administration of Mr. Porter, but asked that her father, Joe Rector, be named Joint Guardian with Porter. The judge refused the request, stating that he would appoint some businessman if the minor desired, and then that's when they selected Mr. Young. Okay? Uh, the Sarah Rector allotment is in the Cushing Field and has on it more than 40 producing oil wells. The receiver now has in his hands cash and securities aggregating $300,000 belonging to the minor. It is probably... Some of this money, it is probable that some of this money will be placed in interest-paying investments in the near future. See, this is what I, why I was watching everything in terms of these different articles. I went and dug them up so I could follow. See, as much money as she was making, right? As much as she should have been making. Um, doesn't it seem that there's that uh, they keep passing this money around and it's not as much as it should be. Okay? Um, but yeah, she wanted her father to be a co-guardian, but the courts wouldn't allow it. Ain't that something? But now here, check this out. And I'll be through this part in a minute. Ah, what's happening here? Kansas Cityans. Okay, Kansas Cityans. Now, Kansas City is in Missouri. Remember, they've been in Oklahoma all this time, right? But now, Kansas Cityans after rector guardianship. Missouri court names two guardians and would remove jurisdiction from Muskogee. Now we got states fighting over this. A hearing to determine whether the guardianship affairs of Sarah Rector, the wealthiest Creek freedman holding property in Muskogee County, shall remain in the jurisdiction of the Muskogee County Court or be transferred to the court, to the probate court of Jefferson County, Missouri. Okay? Since the appointment of the Muskogee County Court of M.G. Young and C.A. Looney, as guardians of Sarah Rector, the girl with her parents moved to Kansas City. Now, let me back up a second. See what it says? Since the appointment by the Muskogee County Court of M.G. Young. That's Milton Young. But who's this C.A. Mooney? 
they were appointed as guardians over her money. And her parents said, oh no, we're getting out of here. They left Oklahoma and went to Missouri, to Kansas City. Kansas City, here I come. Okay. Recently, the probate court, having jurisdiction in the Kansas City, appointed two guardians in addition to the ones named by Judge Verner, J.B. McCluskey of Kansas City, formerly of Muskogee, and Joe Rector, father of the girl, the ward. See, now they went to Kansas City, and her father got to be named one of the guardians, okay? They had once filed a petition in the local county court to remove the guardianship affairs from Muskogee, Oklahoma, to Kansas City. The case is without precedent in the Muskogee County Court. The rector estate is worth approximately $1 million. <laughs> I told y'all, this was some deep stuff here. Some deep stuff. They was fighting over that money. All right. Now, and that actually was a good move on their part to get her out of get her out of Oklahoma and move to Kansas City. Now, the sale of the extension leases of the extension lease on 160 acres of Sarah Rector's property was to have taken place in county court before Judge Inlo Verner yesterday. It was postponed till May 23rd at the request of H.H. H. Elliott of Nowata, an attorney. He did not say what all company or other prospective bidder he represented. The protest of John Rector and his wife, parents of Sarah, to the sale of the lease was overruled by Judge Verner. Dig it. Okay? So the court's overruling both parents. And apparently what was happening, now again, this is still in Oklahoma, this is still in Oklahoma, okay? Uh, that's why they hurried up and made that move to get out of Oklahoma. Now, they did sell the, they did sell the lease, okay? Dig this. It says, the Prairie Oil and Gas Company paid through the county clerk of Muskogee, $300,000 for an extension of the Sarah Rector lease. The, the extension is for two years as the minor's lease expires when she reaches majority, which would be at that time. This lease has a production of about 1,000 barrels a day. Whew, this is amazing. Now, by May of 1918, this is Leavenworth, Kansas, okay? It's Leavenworth Times. Oklahoma Well makes millions in 60 days. All right? Oklahoma's greatest oil well is the title that has been given to the Gypsy Oil Company and Frank Gillespie's well in the Jackson Barnett allotment in the heart of the world-famous Cushing Pool. This well has produced more than a half a million barrels of the highest grade oil in the Southwest and has made its owners nearly $1 million in 60 days. Sarah Rector, 14-year-old Negro girl, has oil lands that are producing 12,000 barrels of oil a day, which would sell for $21,000. But Sarah gets only one eighth, which would be two thousand something a day, or nine hundred and thirty thousand dollars a year. And that's almost a million dollars. And imagine now. Remember, the parents are trying their best to take care of stuff, even though there's all this racism at the time. And if that wasn't enough, dig what dig what else is going on. The white people are alarmed. This is in the papers, too. The white people have become so alarmed at the enormous wealth of this young girl that do, they do not like such wealth belonging to a girl of Afro-American blood. 
Some of the whites want to enamel her. Others to use skin success so that she might pass. They wanted a new skin lightener or something. But the politicians are something becoming so stirred up that they're something making her white by passing a law to that effect. If so, it will be the first time a brown-skinned girl has been made white by law. With all the traits and characteristics of an Afro-American, she has too much money and must be white. It's the same old idea of the white man that whenever a Negro achieves any distinction, either in the scientific or literary world, some white men want to declare them white. <laughs> when Fred Douglas began to show his master ability as an orator and great statesman, statesman, white people wanted to declare him white, wanted to claim him. Same thing with Booker T. Washington. <laughs> oh, Lord. But now in her case, they did actually do that. Oklahoma, which passed a law declaring all Indians white, is about to make an African American, Afro-American young lady the same hue on account of her millions. She will be given special privileges to ride across the state in a Pullman car where it is denied others of her race. <laughs> They're so silly. They are so silly. Um, here's, here's, here's her mother. This is her mother. This is Rose. Her name was Mama. Her name was Rose. And, um, uh, you know, she's pretty stylish. And I'm going to tell you more about Mama and, so Mama and daughter became real tight, uh, later on and stuff. But I wanted you to see her. Now, her father's story is kind of sad. Her father uh, died early because what happened was one of their neighbors, uh, I'll, let you, I'll leave the article up here as I tell you about it. One of their neighbors named Manuel, I think it was, Jim Manuel, uh, he went to prison. He went to prison for forgery and stuff. So while he was in prison, he wrote Joe Rector and told him that oil had been discovered on a piece of land which Joe Man which uh, Jim Manuel said he owned near Topeco, Tampico, Mexico, and that his land was worth forty million dollars. So now J Rector. You know, he has seen the magic of oil in his own family. Uh, so he believed them. So he, he, he got the money for his, for his friend's bond and got him out of jail, got him out of prison. And then uh, he took, you know, a few thousand dollars for expense money and went down to Mexico with his old friend. He was going to get some of them oil millions because Manuel had promised him half of the proceeds from, from his land for helping him out. You know he shouldn't, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know what happened. They got to Mexico and Mr. Rector found out that his friend was lying. The ex-convict vanished and left him stranded. He had to wire back to Kansas City to get money to get home. And supposedly, now this is what the family said. They said he was so broken up of, of getting cheated like that. And apparently he must have took more than just a few thousand dollars. And, um, you know, it was an age-old scam, right? And so on the way back, he was just like so broken hearted over this that he uh, went, they said he went in the hospital um, and died uh, suffering from 
uremia. Now, I, I looked it up, and I'm not really clear on what uremia is supposed to be like a blood disease or something. I'm not sure. But anyway, he died in the hospital somewhere and wasn't home. It was in Dallas, Texas. And he was about 45 years old, so they brought him back to... Um, brought him back to uh, Muskogee. They were still in Oklahoma at the time. And that's something. So... All her money couldn't help him. Yeah. Um, oh, but this is where I wanted to read you this part. It said, Miss Rector will be remembered as the young lady whose huge fortune was the cause of so many attempts on the part of promoters and schemers to rob her. In the list of her experiences in keeping her fortune, which is roughly estimated at $10 million dollars, she has had to outwit lawyers, often keeping a bodyguard about her to guard against physical in injury. One such experience was encountered at Tuskegee Institute, where as the guest of Mrs. Washington, a guard of students under Mr. Tecumseh Bush of Waco, Texas, prevented her forcible abduction by a party of schemers who had followed her from Kansas City for that purpose. Miss Rector and her guardians now maintain a magnificent home in Kansas City, where for the past two years she's been pursuing her studies. Now, I'm not really sure about how much of that is true. She did move to Kansas City and, they, and bought a house, and I'm going to show you the house in a few minutes because there's something deep about that too. But now, then she got married. She got married, and I'm going to read you this article because it's deep too. Uh, <laughs> um, high school boy marries Miss Rector. Kenneth Campbell, graduate of Lincoln, wed to rich girl during September. And she got married in Kansas City, Missouri. Miss Sarah Rector, known as the richest girl of the race, was married September 16th to Cam Kenneth Campbell at Lawrence, Kansas. Uh, Miss, Mrs. Rector, mother of the bride, and Mrs. Campbell, grandmother of the bridegroom, were the only witnesses of the ceremony. The wedding was entirely quiet and had just been announced by C.H. Calloway, Miss Rector's attorney. Mr. and Mrs. Campbell figured in an automobile accident last week en route from Sedalia, Missouri, where they had attended a football game between Lincoln High School and George Smith College, which is weird. I've never heard of high school playing a college team. But anyway, the car turned over and they received very painful injuries. They were brought to Wheatley Provident Hospital where they received medical attention and are now convalescing. Mr. Campbell is a recent graduate of Lincoln High School where he made an enviable record. He, he won prizes in athletics and a scholarship to Lincoln University. Mrs. Campbell came to the city from Oklahoma. Some years ago, the country was startled by an announcement of the discovery of, of a millionaire girl a member of the race. It was at the beginning of the Oklahoma oil boom. Sarah Rector was the first to achieve promise, uh, prominence as possessing great wealth. In her wake followed a number of others. Discovery of her wealth was the signal of a, for the birth of a new type of shark, the oil grabber guardian. Riches had come to her from land that had hitherto been regarded as only medium soil for farming. When oil was found, her status was changed from that of a farmer girl to that of a girl with thousands who might become the victim of the avaricious. Of the avaricious. It was at that time that a number of white guardians were sprung to protect Miss Rector and all her money. Much court action had to be resorted to before she was rid of this annoyance. 
Other girls who became wealthy in like manner were in like manner pursued, the latest instance being that of Miss Ann Cully, Oklahoma girl. No certain figure as to the extent of Miss Campbell's holdings is available. She, she maintains one of the finest homes in this city and is known to have other real estate interests, according to her advisor, a race attorney. That just simply means he was black. Mr. and Mrs. Campbell would take a trip as soon as they leave the hospital, during which time Mr. Campbell will decide just what course he is to take, whether he is to continue in school or embark in business. Now, interestingly enough, her husband, Kenneth Campbell, he did go into business because he, um, he was like the, only the second known uh, black owner of a automobile dealership. In fact, he, he had a Hupmobile dealership in Kansas City. But when they got divorced, he later moved to Chicago and became an alderman in Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> Deep. Because I knew about Kenneth Campbell, the alderman. I didn't know his relationship to her. But now here's what I want you to see. I want you to see this house. Because it's still there and it's called it's still called the Rector Mansion. Um but what happened was that she um actually her she is 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 it was believed that she bought the house. Sarah Rector bought this mansion and that they lived there and stuff, right? Her mother actually bought this house. And the family lived there. When Sarah Rector got married, she bought another house and actually bought a whole nother block of houses. And it was known that at the time, during those years, that she partied a lot. And and different, um, different um, famous musicians and entertainers were known to come by there and stuff. Uh... And, you know, party and stuff, including uh, oh, Count Basie and different people like that. In fact, look, look at this picture of Count Basie. You know he was styling and profiling. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah. So, but they did have a lot of parties at, at this house as well as her house. And this is how it looks pretty well. In fact, I'm going to show you what it looks like today. Um, here, check this out. Her house. Never know. Never know. This is historic. Like, I've always passed this place, and I, I always wonder, like, what is this? I had never known that this was like something I wanna, historic. I see what it looked like on the inside. You know, I mean, and it's like right in the hood of Kansas City, Missouri. Like people were like slowing down, looking at us, like, "What are you guys doing?" And it's getting dark in Kansas City. You gotta, <laughs> you gotta go inside. It's just like the purge in Kansas City in the hood at night. So we gotta hurry and get back. To where we live at but um this is her house sarah rector one of the first african-american millionaires and her house is like all boarded and abandoned and everything like that history right here we never learned about this in school you know a lot of our history is taught on the internet but yeah, it's all boarded. I don't know who owns the house. You know, this is the back of the house. Historical, historical. Well, hope you guys like my video. Yeah, um, thank you. The young lady's name is Twyla who made that video. Um, 
you know, by the way, they actually sold the house after the, um, the stock market crash in 1929. It, it hurt their finances. It, it didn't kill hers. She, she still had money. But they sold that, that, that house to a, fun a funeral home. But her mother and, and Sarah, they, they partied a lot. And in Kansas City, one of the ugly things was that, uh, you know, black folks didn't, weren't allowed to shop alongside the white women in the stores, like on Petticoat Lane was, known, was what it was known for. Um, but they would close the stores and allow... Sarah and her mother and her sister, too, to come in and shop all they wanted to with the stores closed. Wouldn't let the white people in. <laughs> um, but, yeah, but her and her mother were known for their fancy Cadillacs, Lincolns, and a Rolls Royce. Uh, they had a Rolls Royce limo. And they would race around town. In fact, Sarah got, some, well, both of them got tickets for speeding, but especially Sarah. She would get tickets all the time. She had a green and black Cadillac uh, that was known for it. <laughs> hey, she was rich. She said, I'm rich. <laughs> um, she married her second husband, William Crawford. And lived a, a, a quiet life. Her mother died in 1957. And uh, she died in 1967. Okay. Um, now this is, this happened in Chicago. And at the time, like I say, we weren't really aware of it. The 37-year-old son a Chicago alderman, Kenneth Campbell, was fatally shot after he allegedly threatened with the crowbar, a crowbar, a woman friend, who lived in the apartment next to his in Kansas City, Missouri. Police arrested Mrs. Nancy Allen Mitchell, 24, in connection with the slaying. Campbell's mother is Mrs. Sarah Rector Crawford, a prominent Kansas Cityan in bygone years. Now, ain't that something I did? Ain't that cold out of You know, <laughs> it's just funny how, uh, I'm not laughing at, at them at all. I'm just laughing at how history is, how, how white folks do history. You would never have known this story at all. You know what I'm saying? Uh, they had long passed the idea of calling her uh, the richest black girl in the world and all of that. But I tell this story because several things. One is, by the way, she was eventually, when she died, she was buried in Black Jack Cemetery. <laughs> but her story is actually one of success. Because as try as they might, she was eventually able to control her own assets and live the full life. She got educated. She got married. She raised her family. Lived to see her children and grandchildren. She didn't have her money stolen away. In fact, um... One of the other children, one was named Danny Tucker, and his two uh, brother and sister, their name was Herbert and Stella Sells, they had their homes dynamited from people trying to steal their land. So it wasn't like um, it was, you know, all fun and games. Uh, but the, the, the biggest trick was allowing for photographs which was not her at all to be circulated as her. I, I have tried to find out who that little girl really is, but I've never been able to find out. And this is another one of a grown woman that wasn't her either. You know. But Sarah Rector, the other reason why I wanted to do this is because 
the, there's going to be a movie about her. Trust me. <laughs> uh, you know, just like they did the movie about CJ, Madam C.J. Walker, which also, you know, it distorted the history. Um, they're going to they're gonna do a movie about Sarah Rector. And I mean a, a so-called major movie. And they might even try and make the girl white, or at least very light. <laughs> um, so I'm actually ahead of the game. All right. But I appreciate y'all. <laughs> and now you have a story that if you want to share with your children <laughs> so that they know that it is possible for things to happen that you never even plan on. Uh, and that parents, some black parents do look out for their children. They don't leave their children just to, you know, to suffer. They did very well by her, I think. And as always, I say, what? No justice, no peace, no love. K-N-O-W. Thank you.